After years of stagnating sales, Gucci is currently the world's fastest growing luxury brand with a brand valuation of $15.9 billion. When the name comes to mind, most think of luxury and Tom Ford's scandalous ad campaigns. But did you know that the fashion house actually got its start as a humble leather shop? Or that it once almost went bankrupt and got involved with a hitman? Don't miss this video. Gucci o Gucci was born on March 26, 1881. He was the son of a simple Italian leather goods maker and worked as a porter at the Savoy Hotel in London. It was during this time that he first became enamored with the glamorous suitcases that guests arrived with from all over the globe. Paying homage to his familiar roots, he eventually returned to his native Florence to work for Franzi, a Tony luggage brand. Years later, he was ready to strike out on his own and in 1921, he opened his own leather goods store in Florence. In the beginning, his main business was making saddles and other accessories for horseback riders. Every single item had one thing in common. They were always crafted from the finest of Italian leathers. His designs continued to gain popularity as he expanded further into the world of accessories. And it did not take long before English aristocrats became major fans of the up-and-coming label. As business was booming, Guccio enlisted his three sons, Aldo, Bosco, and Rodolfo, to join the business in 1938. The boys were tasked with expanding the brand's presence and together they brought Gucci to Rome and Milan. Because of sanctions against Italy, leather was hard to come by in the mid-1930s. So Gucci came up with the idea to begin experimenting with alternative textiles. This led to the very first Gucci signature print, small interconnected diamonds in dark brown woven into a tan hemp fabric. The iconic bamboo bag was born under similar circumstances in 1947. Due to the rationing of raw materials during World War II, Gucci artisans were scrambling to find materials and discovered they could use Japanese bamboo to craft unique bag handles. They increasingly began using bamboo to make the handle to compensate for the lack of leather. And although the original shape of this bag was fairly classic, the handle gave it a touch of the exotic that attracted women at the time. Treated with a unique and patented method, these burnished bamboo handles became synonymous with Gucci. In 1953, just 15 days after Gucci's first New York boutique opened its doors, Guccio passed away. But despite Guccio's untimely death, his brand continued to flourish and Gucci's arrival in the U.S. was embraced by American consumers. The decade that followed was a golden era for the brand, thanks to celebrities who began proudly sporting its designs. Elizabeth Taylor, Jackie Kennedy, Grace Kelly, you name it, they were all wearing Gucci. The logo of the two interlocking Gs was also introduced around this time, as an homage to founder Gucci o Gucci. In the 70s, Gucci started putting down roots in Tokyo and then in Hong Kong. But the golden times seemed to be over. The Gucci brothers were constantly fighting, and even though the brand debuted their first ready-to-wear collection in 1981, the bickering did not stop. At that point, Rodolfo's son, Maurizio, had taken over. He ousted his uncle Aldo and brought the house close to bankruptcy. But then something unexpected happened. Maurizio Gucci met Patrizia Reggiani Martinelli at a high society party in Milan in the early 1970s. Nicknamed the Black Widow by the Italian press, she was an affluent Italian socialite and high fashion personality. The two got married in 1972, when they were both around 24. But the union caused a rift with Gucci's father, Rodolfo, one of Gucci o Gucci's sons, who disapproved of Patrizia's background and strong personality. Maurizio was an only child whose mother had died when he was five, and his father had always been rather overprotective of him. Patrizia, on the other hand, was born in a small town outside Milan to a waitress and a much older man who made his fortune in trucking. The Martinellis were very rich, but not part of Milan's high society. But Patrizia had always liked fine things. Her father spoiled her with mink coats and fast cars. 
and she made sure to find her way into the elite social circuit. Little did anyone know that a scandalous trial was awaiting. After getting married, Patrizia and Maurizio had two daughters, Allegra and Alessandra. The family led a lavish existence between Milan and New York, and the young couple frequented members of the Kennedy clan and the billionaire Aristotle Onassis. They were seemingly living the dream life, but it all began to crumble in 1983, when Maurizio took charge of Gucci after his father's death. Maurizio inherited his father's 50% stake in Gucci, and he devoted all of his energy to restoring the grandeur of the luxury house, which was struggling to renew itself in the early 80s. The Gucci brand had been losing prestige from over-licensing its famed Double G logo and from mass production of canvas bags. The company started losing money, and the future looked grim. Maurizio had a plan to restore the brand to high-end glory by reverting to the exquisite craftsmanship the company was built on. But unfortunately, things didn't work out as planned. The heir fought for years with his uncle and cousins, who jointly owned the other half of the firm, until he pulled off a plot to buy them out with the help of Bahrain-based investment bank InvestCorp. Along the way, Patrizia and Maurizio's marriage also imploded. Maurizio had grown weary of her constant meddling, and on May 2, 1985, after 12 years of marriage, he threw his things into an overnight bag and left the marital home for good. He told her he was going on a short business trip, but he never returned home. He soon met a young decorator, who the Italian press were quick to label as a gold digger. For the following years, Patrizia refused a divorce, but in 1991, the couple officially divorced. As part of the settlement, Patrizia collected the equivalent of $500,000 annual alimony. Meanwhile, the company lost millions under Maurizio's control. He had been mismanaging business and was not creating enough revenue to execute his grand ideas. His personal fortune was dwindling, and Gucci itself was losing $30 million a year. Eventually, things got so bad that Maurizio was forced to sell Gucci wholly to InvestCorp for $120 million in 1993. Then, on March 27, 1995, 46-year-old Maurizio was shot and killed by a hitman on the steps outside his office as he arrived at work. He would turn out to be the last of the Gucci family dynasty to run the luxury brand. The gunning down of Maurizio and the subsequent murder trial captivated Italy in the late 1990s. Execution-style killings of the city's glamorous elite were unheard of, and Maurizio's murder was the talk of the town. Patrizia was an immediate suspect. She had openly threatened to kill Gucci after the split, but without evidence, the crime went unsolved for nearly two years. A tip-off led to her arrest in 1997, along with four others, including the hitman. In 1998, she was convicted of arranging the killing and sentenced to 29 years in prison. The trial garnered intense media interest and is where she became known as Vidova Nera, or the Black Widow. After she was arrested, the media touted all typical theories about her likely motives. She was jealous of Maurizio's girlfriend. She wanted his money. She was bitter about his neglect. She was plain mad. As it turned out, she was actually most furious about the fact that Maurizio had sold out. Everything she was stemmed from being a Gucci. It was her whole identity, even as an ex-wife. And even after her release from prison, she couldn't let it go. I was angry with Maurizio about many, many things at the time, she said. But above all this, losing the family business, it was stupid. It was a failure. I was filled with rage, but there was nothing I could do. He shouldn't have done that to me. While the public loved the whole saga, the Gucci company was less content. After decades of infighting among the heirs of founder Guccio Gucci, the brand was no longer under family control. Maurizio had not only ousted his relatives from the business to become CEO, but he had also been forced to sell his stake 18 months before he died, and ownership was taken over by InvestCorp. Could things ever get better again? This is when Tom Ford joins the picture. When he landed the role of creative director at Gucci, the now world-known fashion designer and film director was still a relatively unknown designer. But in the following decades, his vision saw the label ascend to new, unknown heights. 
He managed to rebrand the label and make it renowned for its sleek, innovative, and often controversial aesthetic. But the success was not handed to him on a silver platter. At the time, Gucci was going through its hardest phase. Previous chief designer Don Mello had just walked out to join Bergdorf Goodman. The sales were dropping drastically, and at one point Gucci couldn't even meet its payroll. Things were going so bad that in October 1994, the publicist for Gucci nearly begged journalists to attend Ford's first women's show in Milan. People were skeptical, and despite its golden association with playboys and Hollywood goddesses as well as creative director Don Mello's success, Gucci had failed to achieve its potential. With Maurizio Gucci and Don Mello gone, Ford, who in his four years at Gucci had been an invisible backroom presence, was now on his own. Given the brand's uncertain future, he felt depressed and said he was ready to leave after the fall 1994 show. But within a year, he would be hailed as the most directional designer in Milan for his sleek tailoring and retro 70s glamour. As it happened, his sense of failure became his strength. He felt he could do as he pleased because he had nothing to lose. I had a moment where nobody was looking at anything I did, he famously said. Preparing for his Gucci men's show in January of 1995, he began questioning how he thought people wanted to look. At the time, Gucci's archives consisted of a cardboard box filled with press snaps of movie stars like Liz Taylor and Grace Kelly wearing Gucci scarves, or walking through an airport with a bag. The glamour of Gucci resided in the celebrities rather than anything they specifically wore. That's what Ford tapped into and he would emphasize that notion in his shows by putting a single spotlight on the models as each came down the runway. Versace often used the same effect, but the difference was that Ford killed the backlight so that you were forced to notice the clothes and the models. Ford also had the sense that people wanted to look sexy again. Fashion had reached the point where it was all minimal and proper, and he thought it was time for a change. This is when Gucci became sexy. The year Maurizio died, Gucci went public on the New York and Amsterdam stock exchanges, and Ford showed his breakout fall 1995 collection. Gucci surprised everyone and scaled rapidly. Ford produced scandalous campaigns that earned him the reputation of fashion's greatest provocateur. And despite severe criticisms, his tactics proved effective. The sales were boosting, the buzz was escalating, and Ford's role at the newly founded Gucci Corp conglomerate was increasingly important. A few years after Ford's breakout, the company peaked the interest of Prada, which took a 9.5% stake. Between June 1998 and February 1999, Bernard Alnault began to amass Gucci shares, eventually building up a stake of 34.4% through a series of transactions before attempting a takeover, which ultimately failed. Although Ford was expected to become the brand CEO in 2006, he eventually left Gucci and went on to found his own Tom Ford fashion label in 2004. Today, the Gucci fashion has a brand value of $33.8 billion, and together with Louis Vuitton is one of the only two luxury brands to have been ranked among the top global brands every year since 2000. The Gucci logo is regarded as one of the most recognizable in terms of luxury branding, and the brand itself has developed over the years as a symbol of abundance. This was the story of a historic fashion brand that started out with humble beginnings, but eventually was taken over by greed and even got involved with a hitman after almost going bankrupt. Despite the criticism, Tom Ford managed to elevate the Florence-based fashion house to the next level through his unusual tactics. And Gucci is still plucking those fruits today and was awarded the title of the world's hottest brand for Q1 2021. This goes to show that sometimes going against the grain can have enormous and lasting effects. We hope you've been inspired. Do you have a business in mind that you would like us to cover in the future? Then share it in the comments. And make sure to take a look at our channel for more inspiring stories.